it is at least tempting to say, and I'm uh, here, that maybe the I notion of the ideal of beauty represents the point of beauty. But if it's the point of beauty, it's a point of beauty that's in tension with free beauty. So it looks as if we have this tension opened up between the way in which Kant wants to, to talk about free beauties and the way he wants to give a certain privilege to ideal beauties. Um, And I'm not clear that he ever explicitly overcomes that duality in his account. One question we can ask ourselves is art beauty should we be talking about couple of weeks, is our beauty on the side of ideal beauty or on the side of free beauty? If you think about Renaissance art and classical realism, you're going to say, oh, it's on the side of ideal beauty, Rembrandt. But then if you think of the landscape, the abstract painting, the still life. You say, no. <laughs> Beauty's on really on the side of free beauty. Paint, art's on the side of free beauties. And the notion of like how do we add these up? Can we? How do they overlap? Yeah? Here in beauty about which you can't get around, right? Okay. A any questions about uh, um, ideal of beauty, or can we move on to the fourth moment? Yeah. Uh, the ideal beauty it shows also the, like you said, the picture of the freedom of uh, the human freedom of human soul. So how is this ideal beauty, uh, the relationship between ideal beauty and freedom? What, uh, this freedom, what's the difference? Of, um, because this freedom is actually also kind of freedom to purpose. Or what, what's the difference from a free beauty? Yeah, that's, that's great. great. So, so Schiller's answer to my question, uh, the question is, what's What's the relationship between free beauty and freedom in relation to ideal beauty? And Schiller, uh, early on, changed his mind, uh, but in the Callius letters, um, suggests that all beauty is an image of freedom realized. And the reason he says that First of all, ask yourself the question, what the hell does freedom look like? <laughs> right? Does freedom look like anything? Well, Schiller says, yeah, I'll tell you what it looks like. It looks like a flower. <laughs> he doesn't say that, but, but his thought is that if an object, if an object can have either, its structure can have two sources. Either it's determined from without, in which case it's a bit of mechanical nature, but if it's not determined from without, that is, if we look at an object and say, no, whatever that is, its very being there looks to be a consequence of what it is and not from what's determined it, right? So 
one of the things that almost all pictures of ugliness share is the image of gravity. Gravity is a source of much ugliness. Right? It's, it's, gravity is um, what makes us all feel the weight of the world, literally. Um, and Schiller says, what is more beautiful than a bird? who seems untouched by gravitational force. So if it's not determined from without, Schiller says, then we say its form comes from its own self-movement, which is to say it is determined from within, that it's purposeful in itself, and not because of anything outside it. But isn't this just a definition of freedom? Now, there are lots of steps in this that I'm skipping, complicated definitions of what he calls technique. But nonetheless, what he suggests is that anything living strikes us as escaping from mechanicity. And insofar as it escapes from mechanism, for which another word is simply death, because mechanism is, is external necessity. And all necessity is just, just the necessity of, of the dead. Then insofar as an object escapes that, then it's an image of freedom. That's Schiller's direct reading of the third critique. Just leave it at that. Whether that works or not, I'm unconvinced. So is he. He changed his mind. But it's nonetheless suggestive of what is what oh, all right. Why does Schiller go that way? Because he's trying to ask the question that when that Gache did ask when he said wild form, excess of form, more form, what makes form more? What makes form appear excessive? Um, and Schiller's intuition, as most philosophical intuitions are, is a negative one, namely not determined. That something has appears to have form in the excessive sense when it has more in it to be itself than is required for it to be merely brought under a con. That's the fault. I don't know if it's satisfactory, but that's Anything else? Okay, fourth moment, modality. And the center of communis. Unifying the first three moments, the, the notion of, the, uh, of, of modality is supposed to unify the first three moments in a common basis. So Kant says in the middle of um, the middle of page 240 that um, for the present our task, he says, is only to analyze the power of taste into its elements and to unite these ultimately in the idea of common sense. So somehow the idea of common sense is to unite the first three moments. The idea of common sense that Kant introduces then uh, is to do some work of, of collecting up. And the debate about all of this, especially about paragraph 21, is going to be whether in giving us an idea of common sense and of necessity, Kant is offering a deduction of the possibility of taste 
or just a further elaboration of what a pure judgment of taste is. That is, the question about paragraph 21 is, does paragraph 21 do the work of offering a justification of the possibility of judgments of taste, or is it just another further moment in the explication of what it is that a judgment of taste is that will then get its deduction in paragraphs 31 to 39. So, the issue around paragraph 21. While paragraph 21 does provide grounds for postulating a cognitive capacity that is a necessary condition for the possibility of taste, at least Allison argues that cognitive capacity that is a necessary condition for the possibility of taste is weaker than a deduction. So something is established in paragraph 21, but something that falls short of a full-scale deduction. And it should be said that nearly now, although this has changed uh, over the past 15 years, but over the past 15 years there's now a kind of agreement that paragraph 21 is not sufficient on its own to provide a judgment of taste. Uh, 20 years ago, if we were looking at this debate, everyone, everyone else, they used to argue that everything after paragraph 21 was redundant. Uh, the redundancy theory has now gone out of fashion, uh, and what we have is a weak reading of paragraph 21 and a hopeful reading of paragraphs um, 31 to 39. Okay, paragraph 18 introduces the idea of necessity. And the question is, what kind of necessity is at issue here? And Kant's answer is that it is an exemplary necessity. So he says, um, uh, right very nearly near the beginning of paragraph 18, page 237, Rather, as a necessity that is thought in an aesthetic judgment, it can be called exemplary. That is a necessity of the assent of everyone to a judgment that is regarded as an example of a universal rule that we are unable to state. Oh, necessity. If you want to lose many sleepless nights, try to think about what necessity means. Philosophy, we distinguish between logical necessity. What other kinds of necessity do we have apart from logical necessity? What else? Causal necessity. Yeah. What else? Ah, is historical necessity different from causal necessity? Could be. Sure. So, uh, 
I'll say in a second. Uh, I'm the, the missing one here, Consone favorite. Well, transcendental epistemic necessity. So I'm just going to And yeah, uh, necessarily true. I think necessarily true is the one that wears. Um, is, is what organizes uh, most accounts of necessity. In most accounts of necessity, uh, historical necessity may or may not be this. Um, well, maybe it is. But usually, necessity, as Kant says, goes together with universality. Hence, a necessity which, in which a concept proceeds the object. Now, part of the way in which rationalism of the tradition is that it has located the notion of necessity above all in the notion of timelessness. So that necessarily true means something that is always true and can never be false. So the question then is, what is, must be the case for something to be necessarily true? And I take it that something is necessarily true if and only if the conditions for its holding are always in place or the conditions for it changing are never in place. Now, it will turn out that each of these... Um, so the reason why I don't like logical necessity as hopeful is modal logic has gotten us in, in the way. And the uh, semantics of modal logic is something that's necessarily true. What? Anyone know? True in all possible, true in all possible worlds. What is a possible <laughs> world? <laughs> it is just such crap. I mean, that Saul Kripke made a living out of this. Um, just staggers me. Um, so I consider S5 to be uh, a load of semantic nonsense. Um, and that was, by the way, Kant's critique of Leibniz, right? Because Kant said, Kant's critique of Leibniz is that logical necessity, true in all possible worlds, is dependent on the notion of what you can conceive of, right? And that, of course, you can conceive, and what you conceive of is just a play of the imagination. So Kant said that by detaching necessity from anything as simple as like, how could we know that? Right? You, you get philosophical free-for-all. And I take it if you want to see philosophical free-for-all, then you just look at all the philosophy that comes out of tracking. Now, what is interesting here is that exemplary necessity connects necessity and contingency. As opposed, so, so but I'm, what I'm saying here is all of this stuff, if you wish, is the metaphysics of presence. All of the traditional notions based on the notion of necessary truth, which is, I think, again, the one that people want to hold on to, because logical truths are just going to be your paradigm of necessary truths, but 
if you are a Kantian, you're going to say, no, 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 you, this is just too weak. It's the necessary conditions for the possibility of knowledge. Right? And then if you're even, you know, and then you're going to do the same thing with causal, causal necessity, causal laws, I would argue, it's the laws that give the necessity. There's nothing in the one thing causing another that's necessary. It's just that causal laws are necessarily true. Because as literally the laws of causality, they are the conditions for them changing are never going to be in place and the conditions for them so on. So part of the fascination of reflective judgment is going to be the way in which we want to make claims about necessity, but somehow claims that take their point of departure from an individual case, which is therefore from a singularity. Which is why Kant says, just before he introduces the notion of exemplarity, he says, it is not a theoretical or objective necessity, allowing us to cognize a priori that everyone will feel this, liking for the object I call beautiful, nor is it a practical, objective necessity, where through concepts of a pure rational will that deserves freely acting beings as a rule, this liking is a necessary content of an objective law. There's a necessity here. It's a necessity that somehow is bound up with contingency. I am claiming to have judged an object as it ought to be judged, and this is the basis of my demand for the agreement of others. I make this claim because I assume my judgment instantiates a universal rule. However, since the judgment is aesthetic and not cognitive, based on feeling rather than concept, this rule cannot be stated. If there were an actual rule, it would be a cognitive and not a logical necessity, not a cognitive, not an aesthetic one. So this is so this notion of of the exemplary instance. This is beauty. This is what something is to be a yard. That's what's at stake. Exemplary necessity, Kant says in paragraph 19, is not only subjective but conditional upon the correctness of one's subsumption under the unstatable rule. And in paragraph 20, he says this mysterious unstatable rule which serves as the ground of the demand for universal agreement is identified as common sense. The idea of common sense. So the principle, the principle that's supporting this fabric of claims, the principle under which the subsumption occurs is not a principle in the ordinary sense, but the notion of a common sense. Common sense. And we're going to have to figure out what this means. 
Um, it suggests it means two different things. Common sense is going to be the ground of the possibility of aesthetic judgments. Common sense is at least this. It is the shared capacity to feel what may be universally shareable. That takes us to paragraph 21 in your handout. And, and all, all that Allison does, what he often does, and he does very cleverly, is Allison either quotes or paraphrases Comte and just adds numbers. <laughs> but he, it shows how powerful numbers are that he turns <laughs> these things into arguments. That is, he has a really great feel for how these things break up. So his claim is, is that uh, the argument in paragraph 21 is these seven steps. And we'll just go through them in turn. And he starts with the that Cognitions and judgments um, must be universally communicable. They must be universally communicable because this is a necessary agreement, necessary for us to have those judgments agreeing with the object. So what's being stated here is at least weakly the reversibility between objectivity, judgment and object, and intersubjectivity. Right? What is objectively the case, if it's truly objectively the case, true independent of everyone, must be statable in a way that is shareable by everyone. And what is shareable by everyone, that is intersubjectively true, that is what we can all share, is therefore, ergo, what we can claim to be objective of the object. So we're getting a, a kind of reciprocity argument between intersubjectivity and objectivity with a lack of clarity at this point of any primacy in either direction. The justification for this claim, which is not, not a deep one, but sufficient to the moment is, deny it, and you end up in skepticism. That is, go either way. That is, um, if you have universal shareability, but no objectivity, then you've just got a version of subjective idealism. If you have objectivity, but no shareability, then you've got solipsism. Right? So since both of those are skeptical structures, then he assumes there must be some reciprocity between those two movements. Step one. Step two. So we haven't, uh, let me be clear, why I say it's a weak thesis is it doesn't disprove skepticism. It simply says the denial of the thesis entails skepticism. Okay? It's, it's simply uh, an anti-skeptical premise, not an argument against skepticism. This entails that the mental state required for cognition in general, the idea of attunement between imagination and the understanding, a proportion between them, the subjective states that make those judgments possible, right? 
they too must be universally communicable. For again, to deny this would open the door to skepticism. Since the attunement is the subjective condition for cognition. So the picture looks like this. Famous person. I in the object. Bernstein tree. So we have the judgment and we'll call it the shareability of that judgment. So there has to be this relationship and this relationship. And if you can't have one of these without the other, without entailing skepticism, okay? A condition of this one, the subjective condition for an object of judgment is the harmony between the imagination and the understanding. And since this is necessary to, since these, step one is necessary, then this too must be communicable. Of course, this is just the subjective condition for these two. Okay? Don't say, don't panic now. <laughs> this is the easy bit. Are, are you saying this about point two? Yeah. And you're already talking about a harmony between imagination and understanding? Yeah, that's the attunement of the cognitive faculties. So that's... Okay. We're going to see, he's going to but say, Allison's going to question that. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Three, this attunement actually occurs whenever there is step three. This attunement actually occurs whenever there is. So if you want to, you can just simply black box this. Okay? This is simply the subjective conditions. Whatever they are, they must be communicable because. The attunement actually occurs whenever the perception of a given object puts the imagination into play, which in turn sets the understanding into action. But this attunement varies in proportion to differences in the occasioning objects. So <coughs> this activity of the imagination and the understanding occurs whenever this occurs. And Further, this has variations, right? That there's no one thing it is. It varies in relationship to differences in the object. So if this had a flower on it, right, it would be a different one. Just one flower. Nevertheless, Allison suggests, and it's unclear whether this is in Kant. Nevertheless, there must be one optimal attunement, that is one in which the inner relation is most conducive to the mutual quickening of the cognitive faculties with a view to cognition in general. And this attunement must be determined, recognized only by feeling since the alternative concept is ruled out. Okay, so, and this is really the puzzling sentence, number four. Number four states that a two-man can happen for even an individual object in a variety of ways. But there should be an optimal attunement. That is one in which the inner relation is between imagination and the understanding.
is such that they cognitive faculties are operating in their own, let's call it, maximum functionality with a view to cognition in general. And this maximum one can only be recognized by feeling. Because we have no other access to it, conceptual judgment will be the same no matter what. Therefore, Moreover, number five, this attunement and the feeling of it in, in connection with a given representation must likewise be universally communicable. So, if this you know, feeling happens, then it must happen with respect to a given individual, simply as an inference from four. But the universal communicability of this feeling presupposes a common sense. That is, we, in order for the sharing to go on, we must assume that the way in which imagination and understanding work in relationship to one another is shared by all the participants. Otherwise, you're going to, again, lose the universal communicability, which you've already agreed to is a necessary condition uh, for cognition in general. Consequently, we do have a basis for assuming a common sense without relying on psychological observation as a necessary condition of the universal communicability of our cognition, which must itself be presupposed if skepticism is to be avoided. There are two conflicting ways of reading this. Let us call it the strictly cognitive or epistemic reading and the aesthetic reading. In the first case, <coughs> what is offered is a strictly cognitive conception of common sense that is not particularly geared to the aesthetic, but rather it provides the grounds of what will be a necessary condition for the possibility of taste by alleviating the worry about what appears a strange condition. So what I mean by that is that on the strictly cognitive reading, what is being suggested is if we share judgments, then we must share the capacities for judgment. And in sharing the capacity for judgment, we at least have the idea that the way imagination and understanding work is something that is universally shared, or at least in principle shareable, but it's not by itself sufficient for aesthetics. And I'll say why it's not sufficient in a moment. On the aesthetic reading, which would be an as-if deduction of taste, one moves from the general cognitive story to an aesthetic story via the moment of optimal attitude. What does it mean to talk about an optimal attunement that is most conducive to cognition in general? It is as if the very moment picked up by the attunement between the faculty reaches a sort of pitch of explicitness 
uh, that says something about what is the case for the minimal case. But nothing, I mean, the point here is, let me get this clear. The cognitive does not entail the aesthetic. And this is going to be the problem with the deduction of taste over and over again. The reason that the cognitive does not <clears throat> entail the aesthetic is because the minimum necessary conditions for judgment occur, that is, the coordination between imagination and understanding, occur when there's conceptual determination. And that doesn't tell us what happens when there isn't conceptual determination. So problem one is what we don't know is why the relationship between imagination and understanding that's necessary for cognition should be related to what happens when we're not cognizing. So the question is, what's the relationship between the cognitive story <coughs> and the aesthetic story? And the way this gets, gets played out very often is by use of, of inflated words. So Gache, I say this as a friend, Gache says on page 82 of his book that the universality of aesthetic judgment rests on mere form, the form of the objects, the form of what is, and here's the great phrase, eminently cognizable. What makes something eminently cognizable as opposed to just cognizable? But the difference between eminently cognizable and cognizable is supposed to get the relationship between the cognitive and the aesthetic. And as far as I can see, in the Gache story, it just gets played out by the word eminently. In, in um, Allison, it gets played out in that language of optimal attunement in, that is most conducive to the mutual quickening of the cognitive faculties. For the cognition of a pencil? I mean, in, in other words, there's a gap here. And the issue of the deduction is precisely how we relate the patent fact that we require a harmony between imagination and understanding for cognition, when there is no free play, when there is exactly determined relation between imagination and understanding, and what happens in the case of free play, and how one story bears on the other story. Okay. That's going to be the issue. There was a question coming up. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I was just So, the argument for the entailment obviously fails in this question banking because cognitive judgments are interested and judgments of taste are disinterested. Cognitive judgments are ones in which the understanding determines the imagination, while in judgments of taste, the imagination is, uh, exercises a free play of the cognitive faculty and the attunement occurs as a consequence of free play. And this is underlined by the question of whether taste is original 
we have it, or only regulative? Which is the question he asks in paragraph 22. Right? Uh, page 240. Um, and nearly everything I want is going to say is going to go on. That we do actually presuppose this indeterminate center, the common sense, is proved by the fact that we presume to make judgments of taste. But there, is there in fact such a common sense as a constitutive principle of the possibility of experience? Or is there a still higher principle of reason that makes it only a regulative principle for us in order to bring forth in us, for higher purposes, a common sense in the first place? Well, common sense was supposed to be the ground, but he's now suggesting that this thing that was a ground, we may not have it. And then the question is, if we don't have it, why should we believe we can share our judgments? And why would we demand it of other people? So, so he seems to have got himself now, these are all good reasons, by the way, um, for thinking. So, so the question is, is common sense constitutive or regulative? That's another way of stating the same thing in purely constitutive terms. That we cannot even begin to answer this question, given what goes on in paragraph 21, is all the evidence in the world for saying that the deduction of taste does not occur there. That it simply sets up the uh, background for the deduction of taste. Okay. Let us uh, move right on to the deduction of taste. Um, And what I want to say about the deduction of taste is that the entire problem that we have just looked at, let's call it the relationship between the minimum notion of required shareability or the normative maximum, riddles the deduction itself. And it's not idle that it does so, since on one reading, the question of, of the deduction of taste is purely epistemological, and on the other, it's emphatically normative. So the issue is, how does the epistemic and the normative go together in the question of taste? And part of that we're still not going to get there, although I promised it two or three weeks ago, is different accounts of what Kant means by the harmony of the imagination and understanding. I'm plain not going to say everything today, so let me simply lay out the, the setup for the deduction of taste, and then we'll I guess save the deduction and the analyses for next week. Um, although that will go more quickly than you might imagine, since the deduction is one of the most disappointing passages in all of Kant. Right? It's only two sentences, and they're not wholly persuasive. Um, which means that for next week, week, you should start reading The Sublime. And that will take us on a totally different path. Okay. The deduction of taste occurs in paragraphs 31 to 39. For whatever reason, he puts the sublime in the middle of all that. One of those bizarre Kantian gestures. Uh, against the background, of the analytic of taste, the deduction hardly says anything new. Kant calls it, in fact, easy, since it does not justify the objective reality of the concept. Beauty is not a property of things and is not cognitive. 
all it asserts, he says, um, uh, on 290, the very end of the story, Is it 290 or 290? 297. Yeah, in the comments, right at the very end of 290, he says, all it asserts is that we are justified in presupposing universality in all people, the same subjective conditions of the power of judgment that we find in ourselves. Apart from this, it asserts only that we have subsumed the given object correctly under these conditions. So this is what the deduction has to establish. Okay. It simply asserts that we are justified in presupposing universality in all people, universally in all people, the same subjective conditions of the power of judgment that we find in ourselves. Just that. Because if I can presuppose that, that is everyone shares the power of judgment I have, then I am entitled, right, when I say something is beautiful, to say my judgment ought to be shared. That's his thought. And this deduction applies solely to pure judgments of taste. And furthermore, we are never in a position to determine with certainty whether a good a given judgment of taste is pure. So, the, so we never know if judgment of taste is pure, we never know if we've done this assumption correctly, but if it is pure and we've done it correctly, then, if the deduction is true, we are entitled, so on and so forth. Okay? Uh, and furthermore, this, that in the, the sublime, there is no separate deduction, or as Kant puts it, in the case of the sublime, the exposition of the sublime and the deduction of the sublime are the same. That sounds weird, but the sublime in Kant is not what you think it is. Okay. Pure judgments of taste covers both nature and art. Art beauties uh, can be free. And adherent beauties, again, um, for the purposes of this analysis, we've already learned that insofar as they are beauties, they are judged just like free beauties. How this plays out for art, we'll come to. Hence, for the purposes of argument, the focus is on natural beauty, and therefore on the purposiveness of nature. So the deduction must show that judgments of taste are possible. That's all. He doesn't show that anyone's ever made one. He doesn't show that anyone's made a good one. Uh, he just says that they're possible. Which entails at least that the conditions obtained and the claims made are valid. He then sets up a, a variety of, of sub-requirements for a judgment of taste, the first of which is stated in paragraph 32, namely that judgments of taste are possible only if you judge for yourself. And he defends the young poet for stubbornly thinking that his young work is excellent, even though he or she is wrong. Um, he goes on to say that classics are not models to be imitated, but put others on the track whereby they could search within themselves and so adopt their own or a better course. And then he talks about exemplarity, and he says exemplarity is following by reference to a precedent rather than imitating um, 
Why is he talking? What, what's all this about? Classics, exemplarity. It's the same as the question of freedom. How do you teach someone to be free? Because after all, to teach someone to do art is a way of teaching freedom. Indeed, arguably, the teaching of art is one of the exemplary practices in which human, burn, human beings learn freedom. Well, learning freedom turns out to be, why, why freedom? Because I take it we all think that artworks are unique, they are created, that what makes an artwork an artwork is not merely that it's the exact imitation, although imitation is a way of learning technique, but to make art is to learn to make something new. So freedom is the capacity to act anew, and art is that human practice in which human beings routinely produce new, unique items. So when he's talking about the role of autonomy here, he's suggesting that in the world of art, both in making and judging, you must judge for yourself only because in art it is freedom that is at stake. And therefore for Kant, the worst sin is imitation. Right? Imitation for Kant is what parrots do, not human beings. Being able to mimic is not being able to do. Okay, so, so all of those accounts of following rather than imitating, having exemplary cases, having classics, are about understanding what? How tradition and freedom can go together. That, that the question of art indeed is one of the places again in culture where we are necessarily posed to the question of how we can have an ongoing tradition which we claim is our own but that it is a tradition not of simply carrying on the dead law but a tradition of the new that is a tradition in which the practice is the production of unique works that each must judge for him or herself. So in a certain way, somewhere Adorno says, the notion of determinate negation probably never happens in history, but it does happen in art. That is, Art really does, in a way, have a history because it is exactly that effort of producing new works as a consequence of a previous tradition in relationship to it by the way in which you depart from it. And you set your relationship to it by and just by the ways in which you determinately negate it and go beyond it. So art is, and we'll come to this, the practice of freedom. Paragraph 33, he says, there are no proofs, no rules for judgments of taste. And then finally we reach paragraph 35, <clears throat> in which a uh, subjective principle of taste is set forth, and then in the second step it will be grounded in paragraph 38. The, and we'll stop with this, um, 
do I want to do this? I think we're going to stop right there with paragraph 35, because I think once I get into it, there's no getting out. Um, there's no nothing else. So a any questions in the over of what we've gone today? Are you going to talk about it? I will say more about what when it comes up to the question of genius. Uh, that, that's the locus classicus of the question of, of, of freedom. Uh, genius is just another word for freedom. Curious word. Yeah. No, no, no. So well, it's not kind of like. I guess I, I think something like the opposite. I think we don't know how to teach freedom. Um, this is, by the way, you know, of course, the problem of Zarathustra. Right? This is Nietzsche's issue. Uh, how can you teach overcoming? His word for freedom. Um, and my answer to that is we, in our culture, get a glimpse of what that means by teaching art. That is, in, if you do not have a culture of art, it is unclear to me how you can teach freedom. Uh, that art is that domain in practice where for each individual what we're trying to get them to do and of course, this is why most art teachers are so bad, because they use the wrong word. They say, express yourself. You know, of all things, who would want, you know, if you're seven years old, how much of a self do you have to express? Um, uh, um, but I, I take it that that relationship between, let's call it, technique and variation is the model of thinking about freedom. Or again, the idea of a relationship to a practice by your determinate negation of that practice. So it's one of, it's, I think it's why, I think it's one of the reasons, I would argue, why we care about art. That art, um, Adorno says art is the longing for the new. Now, of course, he says we care about art because we don't have freedom in the world. We only have freedom in art. Uh, and therefore, art bears an, un, un, an intolerable burden as expressing our freedom when there is no worldly freedom. Um, um, so art gives us an idea of what truly free action is looks like. Something like that. And again, that's again, Nietzsche just buys that line, hook, line, and sinker, right? I mean, there is nothing that's why he turns it into self making, right? I mean he just says, Oh yeah, it is art and therefore we're just gonna be artists and what's our real artwork? Me! I'm the artwork and I'm gonna keep making it myself. Right? Bad idea. Well, adolescent, so. but same thought. Yeah. Uh, it seems to me that uh, Hegel. Uh, uh, yeah, I just want to may ask uh, how Hegel sees Kant, because uh, what Kant says about this uh, free play and uh, also this non-conceptual. But in Hegel, then also yeah. But in Hegel, then it's always reflective and it's always a kind. Of Kind of uh, rather more, yeah. Although it's not uh, so conceptual like I uh, philosophy, but it's anyway about this. Uh, I about uh, spirit. Uh, it's uh, right. knowledge so, of spirit. So how so so. I, I'm just going to give a hint, but the hint has to be this: the great debate between Hegel and Kant on aesthetics is that. For Hegel, there is no significant natural beauty. 
he just thinks that is provincialism, right? All aesthetics <coughs> is the philosophy of art and not nature. So the question about the relationship between Kant and Hegel is the same question I asked in the first hour, namely, what is the role of nature in Kant's idea of beauty? For Hegel, just freedom just takes up all the space, right? Uh, for Kant, the question is, what is the uh, role of nature, and therefore, second question, what's the relationship between judgments of natural beauty and judgments of beauty in art? How do they relate to one another? So that, that's how we get attraction on the question. Yeah? Um, so you said So, 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 don't worry too much about the words ultimate eminent. What you're hearing correctly is I have insisted upon the fact that in judgments of beauty, there must be a moment of excess or dissonance. Um, but that moment of excess or dissonance is a moment in which form emerges out of conceptuality. It's the excess beyond conceptuality that's going to let us experience form in its purposiveness. While in the case of the sublime, the excess is the explosion of non-form. Right? So there's both, so both beauty, so on my reading, at any rate, it's certainly the case that both beauty and the sublime are about excess, but in very different ways. And there's a good question about how they connect up if they do. But it's not, the notion of eminent is just a word for eminently cognizable is not sublimely cognizable. Sublime is always going to be the destruction of form for reasons we'll come to. Yeah. The sublime is nothing but a kind of violence. Uh, I mean, it's violent action, it's embodied. It's quite, it's quite tense, tense. Beauty is not supposed to be violent, because if violence is violation, then violation has to have the destruction of form in one of its moments. So that notion of violence seems to me only useful. I don't like the misuse of the word. It's overused. So my, my line is the word violence is usable just in case there is a violation of something that ought not to be violated. Otherwise, it's just using a jumped up word for metaphorical excitement. The sublime is an experience of formal violence. Because it's the violation of the boundaries of the imagination, and of, therefore, the integrity of the body. So the sublime will have real violence. Well, for the time. Okay, they're going to throw us out. So before they do, we'll leave. Be dignified, not let gravity take its course.